there, everyone. Welcome to Weekly Hope. I'm Kirsten Hagland, your host. Um, this is our unofficial host of the show, Elsa. She says hello to everyone. Uh, it's great that you're joining us this week because we've got a really, really neat show. If this is your first time joining us, welcome to this space. What we do here at Weekly Hope is bring in clinicians, experts, advocates, people with recovery stories from all over the country and all over the world to share their wisdom and insight into eating disorder recovery. So that's what we are doing. We're here usually every Wednesday. Sometimes we're here two times a week. Uh, but we've, you know, if this is something that you're interested in and after today's show, you're like, yeah, I really, really want to make sure that I'm signed in and can check out other episodes of Weekly Hope. Um, make sure to follow us on our Facebook page, Eating Disorder Hope Global, right here. And also, you can go back and check out past episodes as well. On our Facebook page, on our videos, you can see all of the former episodes of Weekly Hope, so you can check that out if you are interested. So that's a little bit about what we do here. Um, we've got a really uh, interesting topic today. Um, it's the health at every size movement. And Many of you have probably heard of this before if you're someone who's been active in the eating disorder recovery community for a while. Maybe this is the first time you're hearing of it, but we're going to talk about what it is, what it really means, and dispel some of the myths and misconceptions, especially from the broader medical community, about what this movement really is. And so for that discussion, I'm really excited to bring in our guest. Um, we're welcoming Dr. Jennifer Gaudiani to the show. She has been a, a pioneer and advocate and really an, an incredible force in this field for, for the last couple of, of decades, I guess. Um, but I don't want to say decades because she's she's a beautiful young woman. Um, <laughs> so, but, um, but Dr. Gaudiani is the founder of the, the Gaudiani Clinic, which is in Denver, Colorado, um, and she's an internal medicine doctor, and she'll explain a little bit about um, um, a little bit more about what that is exactly. Uh, but she has a really different area of expertise when it comes to treating eating disorders than um, a, a clinician, a therapist, or a registered dietitian. It's a totally different way to look at the problem. So she's going to explain about what they do there, and also at the Gaudiani Clinic, they do telemedicine, which is obviously being able to treat people from all over the country using technology. So she'll explain a little bit about that too. Um, Dr. Gaudiani also has a book coming out, which is super exciting. I'll let her explain about it, but it's called Sick Enough. It is out on September 27th, but of course she will give you um, the opportunity to get some pre-order information about that if you are interested. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Gaudiani to the show. Welcome. Mm -hmm. So much, Kristen and Elsa. Yes, thank you <laughs> so much. Um, so, uh, and you are joining us from Denver, Colorado today, right? I sure am. Wonderful. And you know, if, if you're watching this and you're signing in, please let us know. Say hello. Um, Megan already gave us a wave there. Uh, let us know your name, your story. Ask any questions throughout the broadcast because Dr. Gaudiani is just super cool and very, very open. So don't be afraid. Don't hesitate to ask your questions and share your thoughts throughout the broadcast. And let us know also where you're signing in from, because we usually get people in here from all around the world. So we'd love to, to hear from you. So, all right. So first of all, I said she's an internal medicine doctor, and that gives her a little bit of a different lens in how she looks at and how the clinic treats eating disorders. So why don't you just explain a little bit about what an internal medicine doctor is and what you do with your treatment? Yeah, thanks, Kristen. So, you know, I've been so lucky to have gotten into this field as an internist. And an internist is basically a medical doctor who doesn't see pregnant people, doesn't take care of kids, and doesn't do surgery. But we take care of the whole person otherwise. And we make up a lot of the folks who are primary care doctors, as well as I used to be an internist in the hospital setting. And I used to help run the acute center for eating disorders at Denver Health. And then in 2016, I started my clinic, the Gaudiani Clinic, which provides subspecialty care, or even just primary care, to people of all genders, all ages, and all body shapes and sizes from around the United States. Basically acting as the doctor who takes care of the physical side of eating disorders and the measurable as well as unmeasurable medical problems that happen in people's bodies. And I work as part of a multidisciplinary team with wonderful therapists and dietitians around the country. 
Awesome. And and I just want to say we've got Pippa in here. She says hello from Oregon. Hey, Pippa. Um, oh, we have Deborah Schlesinger back. Thank you so much, Deborah. It's nice to see you. Deborah's the founder of Mothers Against Eating Disorders um, from California. Um, Deborah, thank you so much. You rock. Uh, we've got Denise signing in from South Africa. Cool. Ooh. Way to go. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and we've got Samantha who joins us pretty much every week. Samantha, hey, so great to see you here. Um, cool. So, and talk a little bit about what a subspecialty is for those of us who, who don't necessarily know. Yeah, so most medical doctors don't know that much about eating disorders, as many of you may have learned to your sadness. In fact, I actually re regard doctors as being kind of an oppressor class who does harm to a lot of people with eating disorders. People of all different shapes and sizes may go into the doctor, and if they're having their bravest day, they may say, I'm struggling with food and body image only to be met with well-meaning people who cause terrible harm by saying, really, you don't look like you have an eating disorder? Mm. Or, no, you couldn't possibly have one because you're not X, Y, or Z weight, or you, your potassium is normal, or it couldn't be that bad. And that invalidates and really harms people. And so I was just lucky enough to learn all about eating disorders and have been in the field for about 10 years now. And I only see individuals with eating disorders. This has really become my passion and um, my pride. Yeah, and, and talk to you about the unmeasurables, specifically as it relates to blood work, because I have heard from so many people and some actually really incredibly tragic stories of, of people who have died um, due to complications of their eating disorder when their blood work was fine. And so talk about the importance of the unmeasurables. And, and also, you know, if someone does have a doctor who is clueless, um, how they can educate their, their, you know, their, their MD, their primary care? Those are great questions. First of all, the unmeasurables are one of the most interesting parts of what I get to do um, because people with eating disorders have such a strong mind-body connection. That is, they may have medical problems as a result of undernourishment or purging or just medical problems that they have unrelated to their eating disorder that keeps them from moving forward in recovery. But it may well be that Western medicine, of which I am a proud practitioner, doesn't know how to measure those things. And unfortunately, when doctors don't know how to measure something, we often say it's not real. That does so much harm, especially for these wonderful people whose eating disorder is whispering all the time, you're not sick enough. And that's why I called my book, Sick Enough, A Guide to the Medical Complications of Eating Disorders, because anyone with an eating disorder, or even disordered eating of all body shapes and sizes, is sick enough to get help and to seek recovery. Because you're right, for patients who purely restrict, their blood work may be completely normal until the day they don't wake up because their blood sugar has dropped. And for people who do purge and who do get used to thinking when my potassium's low, then I'm sick, then I really need to change behaviors. But as soon as that potassium looks okay, they can have a sense of like, oh, now I'm not sick anymore. I guess I have to go back to my disorder. So we have to take a holistic perspective, knowing that how a person is interacting with themselves, their loved ones, their values, their profession, their school, their family, food, that's what it's all about, not about what medicine can measure. Yeah, and no, so second question, how we educate doctors. I mean, my recommendation <laughs> is if you're lucky enough to find a doctor who's willing to learn, my hope is that my book could be a resource. You could bring it in and be like, hey, can you read this? Or can you read chapter two, three, and four? Just because that's gonna help you help me. Um, because it's, you know, I've been so lucky. I have a decade in this field learning from my patients, learning from amazing folks like you, learning from wonderful providers. No doctor's gonna like catch up to that, but they can learn the essentials and they can learn how to help patients validate what's going on and make sure that they do have an eating disorder expert, dietitian, and therapist. Yeah, and piggybacking on that, and just quickly before we dive into health at every size, um, do you have hope that there is a general sense that 
in medical schools, for example, that doctors need more education on eating disorders, um, as there is a growing conversation about fat stigma, about weight stigma, about eating disorders. Do you think that that's slowly changing, or do we still have a really, really depressingly long way to go? <laughs> you know, Kristen, we have a long way to go. Um, I, I used to sit on the board of the International Association of Eating Disorder Professionals, IADEP, and I was part of an effort to create four webinars on medical, psychological, psychiatric, and nutritional topics with regards to eating disorders that we're trying to disseminate free to med schools around the country to say, like, please have your trainees just get four hours of really high quality education at a very bare minimum. But I got zero training. Uh, and I went to Harvard, Boston University, and Yale. Yeah. Zero training. My hope is that a new generation who's really much more aware of mental health and of size stigma seeks that out, but I'm not sure the institutions are quite there yet. Yeah, and also a chance to be a little self-aware and self-critical, even within the eating disorder community. Is this a problem? Yeah, you froze up there for a second. Let me see, oh, now I got you again. Okay, um, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I'm looking inward toward the eating disorder community. Is this something that even exists with therapists and clinicians within the eating disorder field? Yeah, I think that there's two ways to answer that. Whether it's, is there medical knowledge within non-medical clinicians? I think that there are amazing dietitians and therapists out there who have really pushed to learn medical topics because there's no one else out there. And I salute them and love to be able to like, respectfully take that back from them so that they're able to do their work and I can support them medically. Um, on the other side of what the question might be interpreted as, there's still an incredible amount of internalized size bias yeah. in all of us. And that means that we think, without knowing we're thinking it, we have absorbed messages from society, from our families of origin, from the media, and we have parts of us that secretly believe that thinness equals health or that thinness means someone is desirable. And unless we name that, we can't actively combat it. And so people who say, no, I don't think that at all, well, go deeper. You have been inculcated with this. It is in your bone marrow, so you have to actively fight it. Oh, it's so good. Um, and, and as we dive into health at every size, this is a perfect segue. Um, I want to give, this is actually um, just an interesting little background. I was reading up even more on this recently, kind of on the official, because actually health at every size is trademarked. Um, it is, a, it's an official movement. So we'll get into that a little bit. Um, but actually kind of to your point, um, I read this really super interesting article. Um, the, the ancient Greeks believed in something called Kalo Kagathia, and I am probably totally butchering that, but I'm going to spell it. I'm going to put it up here on the screen here so people, I'm probably totally butchering the pronunciation. Um, but here it is, Kalo Kagathia, um, and that was that a person who is physically beautiful was associated with being ethically good, and conversely, a person who is physically ugly, which obviously has to do with shape and size and all those things, was associated with being ethically bad. And it, it seems that, um, of course, we know this is totally absurd, but this is like even an ancient philosophical concept and something that for, for a very, very long time has been something that just comes naturally to people, even if it's totally wrong. Um, the Health at Every Size movement is part of, um, and I think it was, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was um, Dr. Linda Bacon who really founded it. So Dr. Bacon is a phenomenal professional who wrote a book by this name, but Health at Every Size emerged out of a bunch of really vital activist therapists and other eating disorder clinicians in the 90s who felt that there had to be a different way to look at body size and shape, healthcare, social justice, and concepts even of health and ableism that were so prevalent around medical world and come up with something to counteract that. Yeah, and just um, for people, if they're not exactly sure, um, just uh, there's a great website, haescommunity.com, and kind of goes into this, but what is health at every size? Um, it 
is includes some of these components, um, respect, celebrating body diversity, um, honoring, as Dr. Gaudiani just said, differences in size, age, race, ethnicity, gender, dis or ability, disability, um, sexual orientation, religion, class, and other human attributes. Um, a critical awareness, challenging scientific and cultural assumptions, valuing body knowledge and lived experiences, and also compassionate self-care, finding joy in moving one's body and being physically active, and eating in a flexible and attuned manner that values pleasure and honors internal cues of hunger, satiety, and appetite while respecting the social conditions that frame eating disorders. So Dr. Gaudiani, let's talk first about respect, um, celebrating body diversity. And this is the one that gets the most heat, I feel like, from people outside the eating disorder world. I cannot tell you how many times I, when I first started sharing my story 10 years ago with people outside of the eating disorder bubble, um, that I just the kind of comments isn't, and, and even from like, you know, when advocating, um, you know, on Capitol Hill, I, I have done the Eating Disorders Coalition lobby days a couple times, and that's a phenomenal experience. But going into these senators and congressmen and women's offices and trying to educate them, and they're like, well, we have an obesity crisis, not an eating disorder problem. Um, oh, yeah. And, you know, or patting their stomach going, I wish I had an eating oh. disorder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you're trying hard not to be like, ah, just explode in their offices. And actually, Carmen Cool says hello, and I'm pretty sure that she's been, um, hey, Carmen, um, she's been in those offices and those conversations as well. Um, what is it about the obesity crisis that freaks people out so much that they, they completely disown anything like health at every size or you know, eating disorders as a concept? Um, why is there such a block there that these two um, cannot be mutually exclusive? Yeah, well, this is a really complicated and interesting topic, and I continue to be a learner within this sphere, including from Carmen Cool. Yeah. So, you know, I think we can start by saying, well, I can start by saying the most trolled I ever get on social media as a professional is when I engage in this topic, because there is an amazing amount of negative, cruel, contemptuous sort of feedback out there. And I have to sit in my most compassionate space. I imagine that those are individuals who themselves have been harmed by the topics we're talking about. But as a very Western trained medical physician with the privilege across the board, um, what I can say is that I disavow the concept of an obesity crisis or an obesity epidemic. I don't even use the words obesity or overweight because they imply there is a medical diagnosis and a medical problem associated simply with someone's body weight and their height. And that is not actually medically accurate. It's so weird to me that this is cutting edge because it seems so right to me, but actually I only became aware of the Health at Every Size movement a few years ago myself, and like I said, I continue to learn with it. So if people can sort of be aware of their internalized size stigma as I talk about this and take a deep breath and sort of keep an open mind, the idea is this, that when people can nourish themselves for joy and to adequately meet their energy needs. And when they can move for joy within their ability and level of interest. And when we take into account all of the other societal problems, poverty, racism, sexism, um, you know, heterosexism, cis sexism, there are so many things that influence how people's bodies are in the world. But if we were to sort of take all of that into consideration, when a person is able to nourish themselves and to move for joy, their body, sorry, will take on a size and shape that's essentially written in their genetics. And beyond that, there is no such thing as dieting. There's no such thing as sort of trying to change your body size and shape in order to create a healthier self 
if you're thinking about just like changing food or changing movement, and this goes completely in the face of the entire Western medicine organization, which is routinely, myself included, I'm so ashamed to say, up, you know, up until recently in my career as an internal medicine doctor thought, huh, to lose weight, people just need to eat less and move more. That is what doctors everywhere think, and they speak from thin privilege. They often speak from white privilege. And the problem with this classic medical perspective is that it doesn't work. No. It shames patients who have been told, not just in their doctor's office, but by society every moment of their lives, if they're in larger bodies, that there's something wrong with them, that there's something shameful about them, medically problematic or dangerous about them. Yeah. What we know is that doctors have been saying this same thing for generations and it's not working. So we need a new way to understand food, movement, size, and health. Absolutely. You mentioned the word um, thin privilege and let's, can you just explain exactly what that is if people don't know because I think um, it's a really good way to, to talk about this. And it came more into common parlance with the conversation about white privilege in, in a very healthy way. And so how how does this term then apply to the eating disorder field? Or, and well, I mean, just not the eating disorder field, just the world generally, right? Um, so why don't you um, help us give a, a deeper understanding of what this is? Yeah, we understand increasingly that there are certain traits or things that I had nothing to do with that I happened to be born into that allowed doors to open for me in society that don't open for other people. So the fact that I am white and thin, the fact that I'm pretty, the fact that I'm healthy and able, that I'm married to a man, that I have children, that they're healthy, that I'm financially secure and that I'm educated. All of these things mean that I can walk down virtually any street in this country or walk into any office building or get any service and no one doubts me, no one shames me, no one puts me down, no one questions me. And because I occupy those spaces, it would be easy for me to be like, no, this is just how everyone lives. Yeah. But anyone in a larger body, anybody who's trans, anybody who's a person of color, um, all of these different features, anybody who's wearing hijab knows that they don't have that privilege. And it's not a matter of anything but really being aware of what privilege I get to occupy and naming that so that it doesn't come across as taking it all for granted. And then I think, what can I do with that to center marginalized people? How can I bring to light? How can I give a voice, even though I'm not representing those people? How can I help give their situation a voice? So for instance, policy changes, just like you've done wonderful work on Capitol Hill. Okay, yeah, thank you, <laughs> thank you. I thought you were gonna keep going there, so I was <laughs> listening. Um, thank you for that. Um, I wanna ask you, um, before I continue on that, because oh, I have so many questions, I could literally just talk to you for hours, and I'm sure everyone here could listen to you for hours. Um, but what do you say to people or doctors, especially people in your profession, who say, well, there is a weight that is unhealthy, right? Um, or it can't be healthy to be what BMI classifies as morbidly obese, which you've already explained, the BMI chart and all that is incredibly inaccurate representation of health anyway. Um, or it can't be healthy to be this size, shape, or whatever. Um, and we do know that there there can be medical complications, as you see as a doctor, from being one very, very overweight or very underweight. Um, it's so hard even to get this concept without using these words. So what what do you say to those critics that say, well, you can't deny some of these health complications? Yeah, one of the misconceptions about health at every size is that it means everyone at every size is healthy. And of course that's not true. Yeah, what yeah. it means is that we have to unhook an assumption of health equaling thinness. Okay, can you, can, you go, can you back up and say that again? Because <laughs> it's so, so important and so good. Yeah, it doesn't mean that everyone at every body size is healthy. It means we have to unhook body size 
from an assumption of health or illness. We have to pause because in that moment, that's where our internalized size stigma jumps in and makes assumptions and say, and I can tell you from experience, people across the size spectrum whom I've met have either been perfectly healthy or profoundly unhealthy. And of course, at the absolute extremes of body size, it is rare to find somebody who is truly healthy. Someone who's very underweight is almost never healthy. Someone who is in a much, much higher body, larger body, is rarely perfectly healthy. The idea, though, is we serve patients better if we don't make assumptions. I've had people walk into my eating disorder practice who walk around in bodies that would be the object of magazine covers or of envy or of like, wow, how did you get so healthy? And they are in multi-organ failure and miserable. And I've had people in my office who are in larger bodies who get stigma in the community and who have to be watchful of what chair they sit in to make sure it's appropriately accommodating their body, who do not have a single thing wrong with them. So we just have to unhook it. And what I say with patients, for instance, with binge eating disorder and larger bodies, because not everyone with binge eating disorder is in a larger body, is they may well have diabetes and uh, fatty liver and high blood pressure and high cholesterol related at least in part to their larger body size. But what I never ever recommend is a diet because diets don't work. Instead, I say, we're gonna bring a haze perspective to everyone. This is something that applies across the board. I don't weigh my patients in larger bodies. The only patients in my clinic that I even take weights on are those that I'm watching medically renourish and gain weight as they recover from classic anorexia nervosa. That's it. Otherwise, I don't even check weight. It's not a variable. What I ask patients to do, and it takes resources that not all have access to to do this, is let me help them find a Hayes therapist and a Hayes dietitian who can help undo years and perhaps familial generations of weight cycling culture of diet followed by regain, followed by diet, followed by regain, that we need to find a way that makes eating joyful, nourishing, consistent, that they take care of their mental health, and that they see what ways it feels good, if cardiovascular stamina is one of their values, to start helping them move in the world again. Mm. When I do that with my patients, I've had patients go from 300 units of insulin a day to zero. Wow over the course of months, and I'm not weighing them. I have no idea what's happening with their weight, but with behavioral change, their medical health improves. That's just, it's incredible how much this, and, and I know as someone who has recovered from my own battle with an eating disorder, just how powerful transformation is in people's lives. Like when you see real change and you look back and go, I have no idea how I participated participated in those behaviors or my mind was working that way and you see how powerful that changes in someone's life and I often just think that you guys are such incredible rock stars people who treat on a daily basis but what I know that eating disorder clinicians have one of the highest burnout rates but I also think it must be one of the most joyful things in the world to see people truly recover joy in their life and and joy in food because like I love cooking I love meal times with family and the, the joy, because yes, there's problems with using food as a reward all the time, but at the same time, there's such a social element to it and we want to be able to enjoy it. Um, and I would love for you to share, you know, I think that um, there's some really, really great research about the fact that positive reinforcement rather than shaming actually does have um, quantifiable results in helping people to transform and recover from eating disorder behavior. Um, what does that look like in your practice? You know, I will just be humble and say that I haven't reviewed those data and I'm not a therapist, so I don't want to pretend to be out of scope, but my my personal belief and my, my bedside manner with patients is always as their biggest cheerleader and as someone who tries to radiate so much affection and positivity and optimism their way. 
and to help remind them that, that they're not the person their eating disorder tells them they are. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I, I do that through sharing the medical consequences of their eating disorder to help break through denial of disease and to help motivate change. But of course, I never try to play therapist. I'm so grateful for the therapists that I work with to do that role. And yet in my clinic, my hope is that my beloved patients, because you're right, I love my job, feel seen and known as a whole person and really cherished. Yeah, you know, we've got um, a couple of great questions. Um, Leslie, I just want to share her comment. Not, it's not a question, but she said, this is true in the nutritional and professional field as well. And we were talking about privilege. She says, I feel such privilege in addition to my other privileges to have learned about Hays or health at every size. I wish that I could rewind to my early career and revise my weight normative beliefs and early um, and recommendations. Me too. Um, super, yeah, super great reflection there. And even just that humility and recognition is just awesome, Leslie. Um, and then also, um, and <laughs> Peggy says, Dr. G, your bedside manner is filled with respect, and that makes all the difference. I love it. Um, and uh, Megan asks, uh, how does minority stress affect people? Of course, people who are, are um, a member of a minority, and that applies in a lot of different sectors. It sure That's does. So minority stress refers to people for whom they have one or more aspects that aren't privileged. And as a result, they may feel that they have to cover up who they are or explain themselves. They may not get access to services or health care or educational care or financial benefits that other people have. And that can actually drive people into eating disorders. Uh, you know, people end up trying to change how they look, how they come across to the outside world in order to make up some of that gap. It's not theirs to make up. It's a societal gap. I so yeah. often tell people, you don't have a body image problem. You have an exposure to society problem. Yeah. You know, yeah. This is not about individual change. And I think Hayes really focuses on this. Um, that, you know, it's not that I have to fix someone's sense of themselves, and I'm not their therapist, when they're here with an eating disorder. It's that we have to recognize the really toxic society that people are settled into. And sometimes all I can say is, in my clinic, your body is safe. Your beliefs, your loves, your presentation, your size, your color, you are safe here. Sometimes that's the only space that I can control. Yeah, and you know, I, and kind of as a follow-up to that question, what I have is, what advice or what insight would you try to give to someone if they are in a community where uh, there is a cultural norm that is very, very destructive or toxic to their sense of self? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and and each community has their own things, right? The African American, uh, African Camara, uh, can't talk. The African American community has its own standards. The Hispanic Latino community has different standards. The Asian community has different standards. South Asian and Muslim communities have different, um, you know, different things. I mean, each culture's got its own ways that they try to keep people in certain boxes, right? So how do you help, or what would you say to someone maybe who's stuck in a culture that has a very, very toxic view of a body ideal or any kind of ideal that they are, that they can't exist in healthily? Uh, I love that question, and I just have to very humbly say, at the very least, I would name, I would give the patient an opportunity to name whether that's the case for themselves. You know, it's oh, curious. You know, by any chance, are there things that are keeping you boxed in or telling you who you have to be that feel counter to what's right for you? And if they say yes, then I would say, I hold that for you because I care about you as a whole human and I encourage you to process that with your therapist. So, so good. Yeah. And, and I think that it's really difficult with, um, especially honor shame cultures, which, you know, I mean, and this is historic. I mean, Western culture, Eastern culture, there are different norms in these 
these these ways that our cultures have evolved have taken place over centuries, sometimes millennia, um, to develop a certain way of behaving in society, and that it can be really hard to share those things. That I just want to add to Dr. Gaudiani what you just said. If you are someone who feels like you have to hide or suppress what you may be feeling because that's a cultural norm. I just want to encourage you that if it's negatively affecting your health, not only emotionally, mentally, spiritually, but also physically, um, to reach out for help and to not be afraid to ask for help. Um, I know that that's such an important conversation. I've had it with many, many people. Um, and so, all right, I want to ask you a sensitive question. Uh, because I personally don't know how to deal with this, and it came up the other day on social media. So um, I, I came across an, an issue. So with um, it on our Eating Disorder Hope Instagram page, um, I said, you know what? I want to try to start featuring more people's recovery stories um, rather than just inspirational, you know, quotes, messages of hope, all that. Because you know, people's stories, when you see someone, when you meet someone, you hear from them, it's super powerful. So um, I started to do some research on Instagram and the recovery community is strong on Instagram. However, I just was scrolling through pages and pages of white women. Mm. And I was really trying hard to find diverse, more diverse body types and, and women of color, women of different, different backgrounds, you know, more, a more diverse profile. So first of all, if anyone has any influencer or whatever that they know and they follow and they want to put it in the comments so um, so I can find them, like, please let me know <laughs> because I really, really want to know who these women are and feature them. So that's the first. I didn't mean to – I wasn't intending to go there, but I thought I would as well. Um, but – then there was with you know with featuring one um, woman's journey and it was she had a really really great positive message. Then there was some pushback in that well she has a uh, uh, not like a oh well she you know she her stomach's not fat or or she doesn't look like this or she may be in what the world would say is a you know the ideal body type or whatever so that doesn't count or that recovery story, those feelings don't count. And it's it's really hard because I know, I remember when I was in recovery, like I haven't, I, I, I have thin privilege, like 100%. My mom was always lean and that that's those are my genes, right? Um, I can't control that. And um, so I was really scared when I first started to share my recovery stories. Well, I don't want people to look at me and go, well, uh, like, don't even complain. Don't sit there and complain. You're in a thin body. And then that was the same kind of, um, you know, Instagram response. It wasn't me. It was someone else. But how do we, how do we do this? Because there's the other end of the spectrum too, where people who are in recovery or have recovered and have a naturally I don't even know, not even thin or normal body type, but then are their recovery feelings not valid because they're in that what society says in a, is an okay body. I feel like I'm rambling, but it's it's a hard way to, <laughs> to to frame this question. Like, I just I don't know. What do you do with that? How do you yeah, confront that's a that? Very hard question, and it covers a diverse set of conversations. Um, look, we live in a society where people get Instagram followers because they're posting hypersexualized photographs taken of themselves exposing a large amount of skin in a very narrowly defined beautiful body. So this is our society and we in the eating disorder world, whether we've been recovered ourselves or have an eating disorder or a clinician or support someone we love who has had an eating disorder, we face an uphill battle at absolutely every turn. The more we can center marginalized voices. As you say, the more we can ask who out there knows people of color who are posting on this, who out there is focused on clinicians of color or diverse clinicians who are taking care of people, how do we give them a microphone? How do we increase access to care for people who don't look like this, uh, some sort of a narrowly defined standard? Everyone's recovery story is a valid one. And we can't get into a competition of, well, I was sicker and I've been sick longer. This is part of the comparison culture that goes on in the head of people with eating disorders. My encouragement is to meet each individual's case with compassion and validation 
and to find the unique aspects, whether someone's recovered body is a larger body that is at risk for every single doctor they meet for the rest of their lives, telling them they have to lose weight and use techniques that if we said that to somebody who were so-called thin, we would consider it eating disordered, or whether it's a person of color who feel that they weren't allowed to have an eating disorder, or whether it's a male patient who doesn't even connect with the idea of how eating disorders are portrayed in the media when it comes to his body. We just have to realize that everyone's recovery story is worth triumphing over. Mm, absolutely. And I love that you said, I put your quote up on the screen, everyone's um, recovery story is, is a valid one because I think, you know, it can be so easy to get judgy about people's journeys and how they feel in their bodies. Like just in the same way that we don't want to tell people who are fat shamed and have so much stigma about their weight in one body um, that, you know, you can't possibly have an eating disorder because of your weight, shape or size. Um, we don't want to do that with people on the other end of the spectrum either or anywhere in between. Um, that's one of the reasons that the, the conversation about atypical anorexia nervosa has been so important because people think that if you struggle with anorexia, you've got to look like someone on the cover of a Hollywood tabloid. You know, that's so important, Kristen. Atypical anorexia nervosa is vastly more prevalent than so-called anorexia nervosa. The individuals have all of the same behaviors and distortions and torments. They just don't happen to be medically underweight. This is a huge problem. Just the nomenclature reflects the internalized size stigma of the mental health treatment community of the people who put together DSM-5 diagnoses. And you know, the literature still uses in eating disorder publications, words like obesity and overweight, or they align obesity with binge eating disorder when they do their studies. There is a big problem still in this community. And I'm grateful to still be learning ways that I can help try to clear that out. To me, Hayes feels like the transformative organizational umbrella like feminism was when feminism started to emerge. And there's still pushback about feminists, you know? So uh, very important to say, I am a great feminist. I adore my husband. And feminism should only be used to refer to a desire for women to experience equal treatment across the board. Amen, sister. I love it. Um, just want to uh, put up some of our, our comments here. Simona says, thank you very much for this, ladies. Simona, thank you so much. Um, Denise says, I wish we had doctors here in South Africa that thought this way, that are aware of health at every size. Um, uh, and Dr. Gaudian, do you have any, any thoughts on, on that? Like, what can someone like Denise, who is in South Africa, um, you know, what options does someone like that have? Or, or what do you think about the international aspect of this? Ooh, I mean, frankly, even in the big cities, I think people are hard pressed to find doctors who follow health at every size. Um, we are a pathetically slow profession to change and to realize we've been wrong and we've done wrong and caused harm. Uh, so yes, inter locally, internationally, nationally, it's a, it's a huge, huge problem. And I yeah. hope it gets better with time. I think that, you know, um, I don't want to sound like too self-promotional, but I wrote Sick Enough, my book, uh, which is published by Rootledge and is currently on pre-order until it comes out September 27th on rootledge.com. That's R-O-U-T-L-E-D-G-E.com. Um, you can just search for Sick Enough. It's easier than typing Gaudiani. Um, and people can pre-order it and, and or, or order it off that. Amazon has just been a little slow to load the cover image and the new date, but you can order it on Amazon too. My hope is that people around the world can use this because I wrote it for patients and for their families, as well as for eating disorder practitioners. And I wrote it in the way that I've been talking to patients at the bedside or in my office for years. It's got vignettes. It tries to center marginalized populations. It is infused with Hayes philosophies. And the hope is that People can bring that book to a provider who's even willing and be like, can you read this? This doctor is a Western trained MD. She's got a lot of expertise. There's no sort of like, you know, she's not practicing like crystal medicine. <laughs> like yeah. this, this is the cutting edge evidence-based way we have to take care of patients. That's my hope is that people themselves can learn 
their families can learn, and then providers can learn too. Yeah, I posted, um, we've got up on your, um, up on the screen here, the title of your book, Sick Enough, and the website, and you said it's Rutledge, R-U-T. R-O-U-T. Oh, okay, R-O-U-T. Okay. So much, yeah, L-E-D-G-E. Yeah. All right, guys, I'll fix that in the okay. comments. R-O-U-T-L-E-D-G-E, right? Yeah, you got it. Dot com, and that's the book, Sick Enough. Yeah, um, it's available for pre-order. Um, available everywhere August 27th, but um, I'll put that up on the screen so people. So that is a really, really great tool if you're um, living somewhere or um, seeing a, a, a professional who is not familiar with this. Um, also, just want to say, Megan says Nalgona Positivity Pride Gloria Lucas is great. So awesome! Thank you so much, Megan. We're going to go on and follow her. Um, Thank you. And also, if you are watching this later, um, after we're live, please post in the comments. I'm going to come back and look at these. Um, really, really appreciate your suggestions in that. Um, so, uh, oh, Denise says definitely going to get your book. Thank you for that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Denise. So cool. Um, so let me just, um, i got to hide the current comment because I want to get your book back up here. Um, okay. Uh, hold on one second. I'm typing here. Guys, I'm going to put the... Um, the name of the book and the website back up there on the screen. So we've got it. Cool. Okay. Um, oh, Dr. Gaviani, you rock. You rock. <laughs> no, I, I just learn. <laughs> this is the most fun thing about hosting this broadcast every week is that I get to learn so many incredible things. Um, one last question and I'll let you have the last word. And that is, if there is someone out here who's watching who feels absolutely horrible in their own body, um, I know I felt that, and I know some days I wake up and I don't feel great in my body. It's like you can't have perfect self-body love every day. Mm -hmm. um, how would you encourage them? Mm. I would say be gentle, be kind, go slowly with yourself. It's almost certainly not your body's fault. You are almost certainly waking up into a sense of dismay about your body because of the words you heard as a kid and the words you hear from society, the words you may hear from your doctor. Be gentle. This is the only body we've got. And our bodies are miracles. They do so much for us, even when we don't treat them that kindly in any variety of ways. And seek help. Seek help. You don't have to do it alone. There are people out there who can make it better than it feels today. Wow. What a beautiful way to end this conversation. Thank you so, so much. Thank you for answering these great, um, great questions. Um, and uh, I'm going to sign off and, and say goodbye to everyone, but just hold on because I want to say goodbye to you officially after we hang up. So um, we're going to say goodbye to, to Dr. Gaudiani there. Thank and you, everybody. Yeah, of course. And then there's her, on um, the name of her book again, Sick Enough, the website as well, um, rootledge.com. I will go in there and change it in the comments as well to make sure we've got the proper link. But um, thank all of you so much for watching um, this week's episode of Weekly Hope. I hope it was an encouragement to you. I hope you learned something new. And if there was something on here that you heard from Dr. Gaudiani and were like, hey, I really need to share that with my doctor or with my therapist or with a friend or a parent or someone who needs some education, um, please feel free to share this video. It's going to be pinned to the top of our Facebook page for the next week and as well will be uploaded onto our YouTube channel. So thank you for graciously spending your time with us. Um, thanks everyone saying goodbye, Sarah, Pippa, um, Jamie Atkins. Thank you so much for watching. Um, Elsa also says, ciao. So if you, if you are um, not loving your body or you're not feeling good about yourself or you're not feeling good about the world, just look at this cute little adorable face and know that she loves you. <laughs> She's all love. All right, you guys, thank you. You rock. Rebecca says thank you so much. All right, have a wonderful, beautiful, blessed week wherever you are in the world, and we'll see you next time on Weekly Hope. All right, ciao.